All right, so today, uh, as always, we need to get back into our project, into our WordPress project. Uh, so we'll quickly walk through that. We've had experience on various days, and so we're going to bring our site back to life and then continue with what we were doing last time. So even though there's this little bit of a speed bump that we have to do this every time we're here, at least we have a site then ready to go so that we can apply the new stuff. So first go ahead and launch your WAMP server, your WAMP server software, double click the WAMP server icon. Let that become green, then you can click on the W at the bottom right corner and select localhost. Remember, we have to set up the database, and then we'll copy last week's work into this week's folder, and then we'll work on today. So open up your web browser for localhost, where then we can access the database software, which is phmyadmin. Question? Um, situation last week. I don't think we know who we need but that's okay. When we get to the point in a moment, you'll be able to take my work from last week and uh, you'll be able to catch up. So we'll be there right now. Mm -hmm. Question here? Uh, if it asks you to update, just cancel that. We don't have, we don't have to do that. So once we've got localhost up, then at the bottom left, you can click on PHP My Admin. It takes you to the address localhost slash PHP My Admin, where we can go to the top where we will create the database. So at the top, click Databases. It asks for a database name. We've got four databases at the moment. We're going to create a new one, of course. We'll call it WordPress. And you can click Create. So now we have five databases. WordPress. Now, uh, this is where we would then go to get my files from last week. Before we do that, let's do the part where, remember, we have to activate that rewrite module so that our permalinks work. One of the things we did last time was change our structure of our links. Remember, the default structure is just ugly numbers, but we changed that to post by name, I believe. But then that requires that we do the following here, which is go ahead and click on, single click on your W, your, your green W. Click on that once, and then we'll go to Apache, Apache Modules, and scroll all the way down alphabetically to find Rewrite Module. And activate Rewrite Module, not Request Module, Rewrite Module. They're close to each other. You want to activate Rewrite Module. You'll see the W cycle through the colors. And it should get back to green. The point of that is apparently, I think it's a bug, but uh, WAMP server doesn't have that little feature turned on. Uh, MAMP is fine. We don't need to do that there. And when it's on a real server, like on GoDaddy, Bluehost, or whatever, then it's, it's automatically set as well. The point of that little option is so that our addresses are something like localhost slash about instead of localhost slash p1578. We have localhost slash by now, 
instead of localhost slash p77284. The rewrite module lets us use, lets us rewrite the addresses so that they're pretty links, which is what web, uh, which is what the search engines look for. A, an address that is full of numbers like this is gibberish to the search engine, but if the address has things that are readable, server databases. That is something that the search engines look for. If your site doesn't have that, it could be affecting your search ranking. And activating this rewrite module helps you with that. I'm going to minimize my browser because I've created the database, I've set the rewrite module, and I'm going to go to the network folder so I can get a copy of last week's work. Go ahead and go to computer window, and then network location classroom data Z. Scroll down to find this class folder, which is Campos Ecom 2. And there's last week's folder. So I'm going to leave this window open so that I can copy this 1130 folder so I can copy it into the folder of this week's project, which is, I'm going to leave that window open, which is then inside of computer. Local disk C this time, C as in cat. And then inside of WAMP folder, inside of WW folder, I'm going to drag from my network folder the 1130 file, 1130 folder, into the WWW folder and change its date to today's date. I'm copying that from the network, and then I'm changing it to today's date, 12.06. So now we have last week's project ready to work this week. I'm going to close the network window, I'm done with that. Uh, I'll leave open the local disk WW folder open for a moment for to, to remind you here that inside that folder it has two things, a zip file and an installer. We don't do anything with these files. These are the copies of last week. What we do with them is back on the web browser We'll go to the address http colon slash slash localhost slash 2015-1206, right? The name of the folder that's in the www folder. Press enter there. Then the web browser says, okay, in that folder we've got the zip file and we've got the installer. Click on installer.php. Notice the address is what I've got in my notes, localhost slash your site slash installer.php. This is just another way to get to it. But if you just try to go to the folder, 1206, it'll show you what's in the folder. What we want to access is the installer file through the web browser. We don't do anything in the folder. We don't do anything with that zip file. We work with it here through the web browser. We've done this a few times before. so. You don't need to do anything with action. Uh, if you want to make a note, when uh, sometimes when there's a problem bringing the site back to life, it does help to select the second option here, connect and remove all data. If there exists a database and you're trying to resurrect a site and it says we cannot resurrect the site, the database already exists with data, and you're sure that you want to reuse that database, you can select connect and remove then whatever is in that database will get deleted and be replaced with what we're about to resurrect. Obviously that's a big warning right there because that could connect to and delete the data of a site that you don't intend to delete. We've been selecting the default one which is that it's a new database. But if you need to delete the old database at this point you can with the second option. I'm going to leave it on the first option. Host, local host, of course, name is the name to access the database in phpMyAdmin, which is in my notes, which is root. 
I'm sorry, uh, name is the name of the database we just created, WordPress. Name is the name of the database. User is the name of the user that can access the database, which is root. And then password is nothing. There's no password there. Click test connection to confirm that the installer finds the database and can access the database. You should get to successes. Possible fails could be that you're accessing our database called WordPress, but you called your database something else. Sometimes people misspell it. They type WRD press instead of WORD press. So I've got a couple of successes there. And then at the bottom, activate. I've read all the warnings and run deployment. Again, it's going to confirm. Are you sure you want to do that? You're about to uh, edit the database. Click OK. We know what we're doing. Depending on the complexity of your site and the database, uh, this might take a moment. And it goes eventually there. So it's saying, here's your old site, here's your new site. They look the same there. That's OK. Title, Victor's Bakery, good. If you need to create an account or advanced options, you can. Usually, you don't need to. So we'll just, at the bottom right, select Run Update. I don't get any errors or warnings. Sometimes it happens. An error is pretty bad, but a warning you can probably live with, and I've dealt with both issues. Uh, but usually the site transfers over perfectly. Remember, everything that I'm talking about here is in my instruction number 4, version 2. Um, you can print it out later if you haven't had a chance to print it. But I'm just going from my instructions, which we've seen several times before. So what else here? Okay, so we need to save permalinks. The point of acting the rewrite, activating the rewrite module a little while ago so that these permalinks could work. So go ahead and click Save Permalinks. It'll ask you to log in and the username, in this case, to act to edit the site. That's what confuses people often. Why did we use root and why did we use admin? We use root only at the beginning when we're using duplicator to connect to the database. After that, we hardly ever use root. We then most often use, to log into the site to edit it, username admin and password password with a capital P. Click log in. We're in this permalinks screen. Just confirm that it should say we're going to use the post name, which is one of the better ways to display your links, rather than the default, which is terrible. So it should say post name, and then we will click Save Changes. So from my instructions, that's basically I'm on. Um, Resurrecting your site number seven. After it succeeds, click on each of the four tasks listed. So I clicked on the permalinks one. I'm done with that. It opened a new tab. I'm done with that tab, permalink tab. Back to my duplicator tab. So number one is done, no problems. Number two is done, save permalink. Number three, I'm not going to spend time right now to test every single page of my site that it works or not. That's something for you to do at some point. So then we've got step four. This will delete the, uh, the installer file and other supporting files so that you accidentally don't resurrect your site at the wrong point. So click number four, security cleanup. It's going to confirm. Just click OK. It 
it should tell you at the top reserve duplicator files have been detected that's what that little red line is saying the files from the previous site still exist so that's why then we're going to click under data cleanup delete reserved files like that it'll say we deleted this file and this file and this file and this file it is recommended to remove your archive file from the root of your WordPress install. This will need to be done manually. And I don't know why it's manual. It used to be automatic previously. Maybe people were really messing up their sites for some reason. And then the author took off the automatic. What that is saying is that in the www folder of the WAMP folder, the site is, has come back to life. There's all the files of the site including the zip file that we no longer need. That zip file is just taking up space and when we go to create a duplicator archive at the end of the day, it'll complain. It'll give us an error, which I think the author made a mistake in deleting the ability for that zip file to be removed at this point. It used to do it. But now you have to do it manually, so make a note of that. You have to go back to your WW folder and delete the zip file, which I will do right now. You can right click delete. Back on the web browser. I'm finished with the duplicator tab. I have my site. Tools. I'll click on dashboard and we're ready to get started. So once again we brought back our site as we've done several times before as we'll do again next week. As you will need to do when you work on your own projects. The more you do it the easier it becomes. It is a little technical but uh, how many of you are getting comfortable doing this on your own now? Okay, a couple people good because next time on the last day of class you'll need to do it yourself. And then if you need help, I'll help you. But you'll do it yourself next time. Um, are, we, are we good here? Is everyone at this point where you've got your site brought back to life? Anyone need a little help?
they would all be in the category four and one of the review is different names. They can go and use the veteran sites. Okay. Each of those sites then were also made to videos. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Is there a way of um, retroactively doing the um, review by the company? Yeah, we can do it before or after the way we did it. We did it first and then we did the yeah. duplicate. Or you can duplicate it first and then the rewrite module. We can do it either So if I could do the rewrite module right now, where do I go to do it backwards? Or the same sort of way you would do it. All right, so we've brought our site back to life, and uh, now we're going to continue where we left off last time, which is that we're going to keep looking at the settings of our site, because there were a lot of settings, a lot of screens to look at. We went through maybe half of them, and now we're going to continue with the next ones. So under the settings menu, hover, on, hover over settings and go to store. We already looked at general and admin. We skipped taxes and shipping for the moment. We looked at payments. We looked at checkout, marketing, import. Let's look at presentation. So let's go to the final tab there, presentation. There's a lot of settings here, a lot to look at. Most of the settings that are here by default are fine as defaults, but I'll point out items that I would recommend. So the very first setting at the left is we've at the top is button type add to cart or buy now. Notice buy now is not accessible because buy now only works with PayPal standard. You have to use PayPal standard, which is um, we are rec I'm recommending in this class we're using PayPal Express, which is the way that it happens is someone visits your shopping cart, they add the they add the items to the cart, they click pay now and then they get sent over to a secure PayPal form where they put in their credit card that gets processed then PayPal sends you back to your website that way it's always secure for them even if you don't have an SSL certificate that's the default if we want instead people from your site to buy your products and stay on your site and not go to PayPal and sort of break the uh, the flow of things a bit then that would require the PayPal standard. But that also requires that you have the SSL certificate to be the most secure. So this buy now is not active because we don't have PayPal standard because that one requires a higher level of security, which I'm not recommending as a beginner. I'm recommending keep PayPal Express because then PayPal will process the credit cards. You'll be safer. Hide Add to Cart button. It says no, which I would say that's good. If you turned off Add to Cart, there's no button that says, here's this product, I want to add it to cart. You say, well, why would we ever want to turn off Add to Cart button? couple of reasons. One could be you're working on maybe um, editing aspects of the site and you don't want anyone to buy a product. So you can completely turn off the ability for someone to buy a product that way, temporarily, of course. You might also want to activate that yes if you've got advanced PHP features to make your shopping cart do more than what is built in. So for most of us, we'll say, no, don't hide the add to cart. You do want to sell your products. And keep in mind why you might want to put yes. Product availability. OK, uh, product ratings. This is up to you to decide. You've been to Amazon and such, and people rate a product. You've heard of Yelp. You've seen Yelp where people rate a restaurant. Would you like them to rate your products, one to five? So that's off by default. You can turn it on if you want. I'm going to leave the default. Choose what you'd like. Show stock availability. When we create products today, we'll see that we can have either unlimited 
supply of stocks, because I can always bake more pies, or we can have limited available stocks. This is the only, you know, uh, batch of cookies with the, with the truffles. So if you say show stock availability and you've got seven of an item to sell, it'll tell people there's seven of these left. That's up to you to decide. I'll leave the default. One that I will recommend, display fancy purchase notification. Click yes on that one. By default, when you add something to the cart, you don't really get any feedback that says added to cart, which is kind of weird. So I'm going to say yes, activate that because you'll get a simple pop-up that says item added to cart, and it'll say continue shopping or check out now. That doesn't happen with the default, which is no, which I think is weird. So I highly recommend yes on display fancy purchase notification. The default of shipping is also fine. We're going to see, we're going to show people how much it costs uh, per sh shipping per products and such. If you don't want that, if you want one big value at the end, you can put no, but the default is fine. When we create the um, when we create the um, the catalog of products, we're going to see thumbnails of all the products. If you would like then to be able to click on a product to see it more in detail, the default here is what you want. Disable link and title? No, it's kind of backwards. If you put yes, it means yes. Disable the title, so no, you can't click on the. The, uh, the, the full view. By saying no, don't disable the title, yes, let the people be able to click on the title to see the full description, the full product. So that one's good. Sometimes you might want to turn this off depending on your theme. Maybe your theme conflicts with the shopping cart, especially its title, and I've had success sometimes activating yes there so that it doesn't conflict with my theme. You won't know this until you start working with, with your specific theme. Add quantity field to each product. Uh, if I'm selling um, cakes, do I want the, the people to select, let me buy three cakes at once, or will it only be add to cart one at a time? So usually you want that. I want to be able to sell two or three at once. Depends on your product. Maybe you're selling your Maybe you're selling your watercolor paintings, and there's only one of them. So there would be no reason to say, let me buy two of those limited editions. There's only one of them. But I'm going to leave this one alone because, yes, I'll probably want to buy more than one of a particular product. Product display and grid view settings are tied together, but we're not going to be able to do anything with grid unless we select on product display grid view, and we can't because list view and grid view are, are part of the gold cart, which I believe is $90. $90. One-time fee to get all of these extra features of the WP e-commerce plugin. And that's fine. I don't need to pay $90 simply to get a grid of products. That's also going to depend on my theme. And the default view is fine. It's going to show you a list of products, top to bottom, alphabetically, or whatever order you want, instead of a grid like Pinterest, let's say. If you want something like that, you do have to go purchase the gold cart, which is, I think, about $90, and they've got sales on it here and there. So we can't do anything there. That's fine. <clears throat> this show list of categories, I don't think it's very useful at all because I'm going to show you a better way to, show, to, to showcase your categories. In categories, we'll see our, I'm selling baked goods. But one category is pies, one is cakes, one is cookies, one is, uh, what else, uh, donuts. So let's say those are our different categories. If we select this option, it'll show a very basic and I, and I think a very ugly looking uh, drop down list of categories. Later, I'll show you instead how to make a nice menu of your categories. Select what product category. Don't worry about this one yet either. We can do it in the way that I'm going to talk about later. But here, if we had a variety of product categories already set, cookies, cakes, pies, etc., we would be able to say, in the main product category, show that product. We don't have those product categories yet, so this doesn't do anything. And anyway, again, the way I'm going to show you later, I think is better visually and uh, more user-friendly. 
Here's something for you to decide. Sort products by the time that they were uploaded, so the newest products would show up first in the shopping cart, alphabetically by name, in order of price, lowest to highest, or highest to lowest, or you will be able to drag and drop the order you want. You'll probably want drag and drop, but I'm going to put it on name for the moment, just because it'll be in order of all the products A to Z. breadcrumbs. This, one, this one's up to you, but it, it's pretty useful in terms of SEO, search engine optimization, in terms of the search engines looking at your site, understanding all your products and pages and subpages. Because breadcrumbs basically... let me see if I can show an example. Breadcrumbs, you've seen them, but maybe you didn't know them. The, 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 their name. Okay, here it is. I'm looking at the 5.1 channel home theater subwoofer, $179, and here's breadcrumbs. I'm it, it, from right to left. This is the particular product I'm looking at, home theater speaker system, which is inside of this higher category, which is inside of this higher category, which is on the home page. So if I was looking at something deep in a category, I would see breadcrumbs where this is inside of this, inside of this, inside of this. Because what I can do is, if I've got breadcrumbs set up, I can click to view all the home theater items, and it won't just show me this product, it'll show me all products related to that category. Those are breadcrumbs. So all of this stuff it relates, and actually what I need is a pair of 3D glasses. So I click on that, and then again that's going to show breadcrumbs. In, this is in a different style now. DLP link 3D glasses inside of Bluetooth enabled glasses inside of 3D glasses. So that's up to you to decide, but I think it's useful one reason why you might not want to use it is because depending on the theme, it may look very plain, it may not look very interesting. But if you know some, some code, usually CSS, you're able to edit any aspect of the site that doesn't quite look how you'd like it to. That requires you know some code, HTML usually, and CSS most of the time. Don't worry about product groups and display there, just don't worry about that one. Show subcategories, don't worry about that one either. Don't worry about replace title, those are fine. Display featured product above product page. This one's interesting why it says no, but the thing is, let's say you're going to be selling in your in your cakes category, you're going to be really promoting birthday cakes. You might have chocolate chip cake, uh, wedding cake, birthday cake, etc. You might have a bunch of cakes, but you really want to promote birthday cakes. We can see that we can set a product as featured. And so featured, I would assume, featured gets prominence. Fe featured is shown first. And that's what this does. But for some reason, featured is not shown first. I'm going to turn on yes. If I use featured products, I want those products to appear before my regular products. I don't know, it kind of defeats the purpose. There's featured <coughs> products, but they don't have their own option turned on to show featured products first. Shopping cart settings, cart location. This is a, this is a bit technical, but the defaults will be fine. Where will it show our shopping cart, our items in our shopping cart? We already have a page that it's going to show the products in our shopping cart. So if we activate that one, we actually deprive ourselves of the very useful widget. Because when we looked at widgets, those were like little mini apps, mini features that we can add to the sidebar or the footer or the header, depending on the theme. So if we select show the cart only in a page, then we can't use it as a widget. We already have the page it on widget, therefore we can put the contents of the shopping cart anywhere, the footer, the header, whatever, or its own page. And if we know what we're doing with PHP code, we can do manual, 
write our own code, and make the shopping cart appear wherever we need it. Display the term plus postage and tax? Yes or no? That depends on your product. If you are shipping products and then you're collecting postage and tax, um, but that postage and tax is included in the price of the product, then you would select yes. Those $200 of that product include the postage and tax. Usually they won't. That's going to be calculated as necessary depending on where you're shipping. We have sections on the actual product categories. We'll be using product categories, of course. Depending on the theme, the description that we write for a category may or may not be used. I'm going to say yes on that one so that I can decide, do I want that text to be visible or not? And I could decide that for two reasons. One, my design might be an, a good design to, sh to display that text to people so they can understand what that particular category is, what they're buying. And it could also be good to help your SEO, because as the search engines look at your site and analyze everything that it includes, it's going to pay more attention to, the search engines are going to pay more attention to the text on your site, not those amazing pictures, the text. So if you are displaying more text, the search engines can further understand your site and rank you better when someone searches these keywords. If you've created categories and added a thumbnail to the category, would you like to display its thumbnails? Sure. Would you like to display how many of a particular product are in a category? That's up to you. But I showed you a moment ago on that, on that website that when I was in a particular... when I was in a particular... Um, product category, it was telling me how many were in a specific category. Like this. So there's one item in this category. There's one in that item in that category. So that's up to you to decide. If you've got a variety of types of products per category, it might be nice to show people, I've got seven options in that category. But if all your categories have just have one particular item or two, maybe it's not that useful for everything to say one, 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 two, 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 seven, one, 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 one. That's up to you to decide. I'm going to leave it off. And then you've got this grid view for categories. I'm going to leave it no for the moment because the design of it depends on your theme. We've got thumbnails. Default product thumbnail, default product category thumbnail, and single product image. So they're all the same size, they're all medium to small size, and this is again going to depend on your theme. If your theme is designed in a way to show pictures large, well, this is going to show you, this is going to force your pictures down a little too small, maybe. If you've got a theme that focuses on smaller pictures and you put in a larger size here, 500 by 500, it's going to force your pic your large picture then into a small picture. So what I'm going to do for the product thumbnails, I'm going to leave that alone the categories, I'm going to make those a little bit smaller, just a hundred, and the actual products themselves, I will say 200. We won't know exactly how these look until we save it and add products and add pictures and choose a theme and such, but here I'm just showing, I don't like that they're all the exact same size and they're not differentiated. Thumbnails will be a certain size, categories another size, and the single product, when you, when you click up to view it larger, 200. But the cool thing is, there's an option a little bit later, that even if you've uploaded a 1,000 size picture, 200 will still work because then it'll show the 200 sized one and someone can click and then it'll pop open the 1,000 sized picture. Crop thumbnails. All of my picture sizes right now are proportional, they're squares. So that means if I upload a picture that's a rectangle, I could have problems. Crop thumbnails? Yes or no? 
Yes means that thumbnails are cropped to exact dimensions. So if I uploaded a picture that's 300 pixels wide, there's a space for it of 200 by 200. Therefore, uh, 50 pixels on the left and the right will be cropped to fit it into 200. If I select yes, cropped. If I select no, it'll take my picture and maybe shrink it or stretch it or distort it to fit into 200 by 200. So the moral here is that um, upload your pictures in the correct sizes so that they're not distorted or cropped incorrectly. I'm going to select, um, I'll leave the default, no, shape them to the right size, which might not be the best, or yes, might not be the best either. That's up to you to decide once you've Well, this is sort of like you're taking a you're taking a square peg to put into a square peg, or a rectangular peg to put into a uh, square peg hole. Um, these are not really like uh, the best way to resize your graphics. You really should have them ready to be in the right dimensions before you upload. I wouldn't rely too much on any of the settings here. These are more like this is the this is the this is the hole to put the peg in. So um, I would be cropping my pictures and sizing them in Photoshop before I bring them into my site. And then these are just going to be the placeholders where they end up in. Um, Show thumbnails. Yes, I want people to be able to see what they're buying, of course, with thumbnails. Use a light box effect. Yes, that's how you can upload a 1,000 sized picture, put it into a 200 pixel sized area, and then have it open up to be nice looking. The light box effect. And I'm going to recommend, just because it looks nicer and I think it's a little more functional, then I'm going to use the color box layout. Both of these will show you your picture larger when someone clicks. I think this one looks nicer and it also uh, I think is more user-friendly. Pagination settings. If you've got a hundred products, the default will be all your 100 products will show up on one page. The, the products page from 1 to 100. Maybe I want to display 10 at a time. That's pagination. I'm going to say yes. Use pagination and just to start off to, to, start off to make it obvious, I'm going to select three. Three products at a time. I think that's very small. Usually you're going to be doing five to ten at a time. Personally, I like to browse like 50 products at a time or more, but sometimes for people that's way too much to look at. And this, I'm just activating three for you to decide what you like once you have your own store. And when you've got plenty of pages to go from page 1 to page 2 to page 20 of products, are you going to have the button that says next page, previous page, only at the bottom, only at the top, or both? Probably both. You've probably visited a site that you know you need to get to the very bottom before you go next, and that's annoying. So if you put both, the button to go next or back is at the top and the bottom of the page. Comments, settings, don't worry about this. This needs to connect with some other service called Intense Debate. I've never used it. I don't really know anything about it, so I'm just going to leave that by default. But the ability to add comments is built in to WordPress. It's not the most powerful. There's other plugins, but uh, it's fine as a default. Click Save Changes. Remember to save changes when you make changes. Any questions on any of these settings here? We'll look at one more thing and then we'll, then we'll uh, move on. Uh, on the top right, 
of this screen, we have a box, Advanced Theme Settings. When we get to the part about talking about a little bit more advanced customization of our design, usually we d the way we do that is via editing the code of the theme or the plugin. At the moment, it says no theme files have been moved to your WordPress theme folder. These files here are the pages that make up the shopping cart. We see cart widget, category list, default, shopping cart page. So the design of the shopping cart can be edited usually through code. But it says none of these files are currently accessible into your main WordPress for protection so that you don't mess up your cart, the design of it and such. But we're going to explore that a bit uh, as we go on. So I want to say, yes, I do want to be able to edit the pieces of my cart a little bit more advanced. So I'm going to select all of these. I'm probably not going to edit all of them, maybe just one. But if you activate all of these, you will then have the ability a little later under Appearance Editor to edit any piece of the cart. Maybe I don't like the way a thumbnail looks, but there's no button that lets me edit it? No problem. I always have the ability under Appearance Editor. This is built into WordPress. This is not specific to that plugin. Anything in WordPress can still be edited in the raw code. It's like turning, uh, pulling the curtain back from the wizard to see what's going on behind the scenes. Appearance Editor. We always have that ability. But first, turn on all those check marks and then click Move Template Files. It says, thanks, themes have been copied. And it just says, it's, it's kind of technical, but it just says, okay, in your folder of your project inside of Themes 2015, you'll see the files to be editable, which are also under Appearance Editor. You can create a copy of your theme by clicking the button. So the particular theme that we're working with, it can be copied to just in case we make a mistake. And if you make changes and, or move things, we might have to flush the cache. But um, that's all we did there, just move those template files. Let's look at um, the last two ones, the most boring ones, but very important. Let's look at taxes. Right now, the ability to tax your products is not even on, so you won't be collecting taxes. And this is really, I can only really show you the technical aspect of this. I can't give you really any advice how to set this up. This is going to depend on yourself, how you manage your business how legitimately you do it, I recommend the most legitimate. Because when it comes to taxes and incomes and all of that, you know, I can get you into a lot of trouble if you don't do it right. So contact your CPA, your tax preparer, H&R Block, uh, TurboTax, whoever you work with, your cousin. But make sure uh, they know what they're talking about here because here you're selling products. Usually you need to collect taxes on products. So let's turn on turn tax on, go to the bottom and click Save Changes, and then you'll get more features. So turn tax on. Product prices. Product prices are tax exclusive, product prices are tax inclusive. So that's basically saying, I'm selling something for $200, did that include tax or not? The default is tax exclusive, we're excluding the price of the tax, because that's a tricky thing. Taxes are different from state to state, from county to county, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, possibly. That's a big issue because some states, if I live in New York and I buy a product online from a company in New York, I get taxed New York tax. But if I'm in New York and I buy a product in Utah, I may or may not get taxed New York tax or Utah tax, or both. Same thing in California. California is one of the weirdest ones because you could be charged 
for buying products in California or from California or to California can be complicated. So usually the default will work. You're going to add tax in addition to what you're, what you're selling. And the tax could be zero. Maybe you're not collecting tax. That's fine. How are you doing this the specific tax add per product tax to tax percentage if product has a specific tax rate? We can create these tax bands that apply to different scenarios. And we can apply each of those scenarios to different products, which would be the first one. That's the most control, but it's the most effort. The second one, replace tax percentage with the product specific tax rate. That one would apply also adding specific taxes to a product, but a bit more individually. So these are sort of based on rules. If this product, then add that tax. If this location, then add that tax. Whereas this one down here is basically add this tax to these different products. It's perhaps a little simpler. Um, either or will work, but I'm going to leave the default, which is replace tax percentage. Yes? Yeah, all of this, all of this purchasing and especially online purchasing is such a mess at the moment. Uh, so hopefully they they make it a little better. But yes, you can set those rules, those if rules and such down here when we get to that under bad names and such, depending on your market and everything. We've got tax logic. Apply tax when billing and shipping region is the same as tax rate. Apply tax when billing region is the same as the tax rate. Apply tax when shipping region is the same. So here it's saying again, I need to check uh, with what's it called? The, I think it's called the Board of Equalization. Uh, every state has one or every city and basically they, they offer this tech support that explains to you this is how you should be charging for your products. Are you mostly in California shipping to California? Easy. Do it this way. Are you in California but you ship throughout the US? Okay, a little more complicated but do it this way. So that is advice that you can get from the state of California, the Board of Equalization. You can call them up, you can read the documentation, etc. because you've got to figure out are you going to apply taxes when the person that I'm billing is the same as um, the tax rate in California? Or am I going to apply it to where I'm shipping it to? Because that happens as well. I can buy a product in California but actually ship it to Nevada. So which am I going to charge the tax for, Nevada or California? Ask your tax preparer. And we've got the first option. Well, they both, if they're both the same, then are we going to pay attention to this or to that? So again, this whole tax thing is a complicated thing. I'm going to leave the default. Apply when billing is the same. The person that's buying it wherever they're at, we're going to apply tax to them from their jurisdiction, where they're buying, where they're paying for it. If that doesn't sound right to you, again, check with your CPA, your tax person, Okay, so then we've got a section on tax rates and tax bans. This currently says all markets, which means all over the world. How much are we charging for tax? And are, and are we also applying it to shipping? We can make as many of these rules as we want. And we, we decided on a different screen, we're really only shipping, we're only selling to the US. So under this market, I'm going to select USA. And then here I can specify by state. So every state has different sales tax, unfortunately. Um, so this could be also a lot of effort to set up. But if you set it to all markets and put a specific price, a specific rate, let's say 8%, 
that's perhaps good enough, you're going to be overcharging some places and you're going to be undercharging other places. It may then even out in the end equalize, but for the moment I'm going to select all markets and one, rat, one tax rate because I don't have the information to set it for 50 location, 51 including DC. Um, and notice you can add more. On the right side, you can add or remove markets. Let's say, okay, maybe I am selling to Canada as well. I'm going to select Canada for the rate, Mexico, whatever, put the different rates. This can get pretty complicated, but I'm going to set a very basic one. Anywhere in the U.S., 8%. Tax bans are special rules you can create and apply on a per-product basis. Please use the products page to apply it. So here we would create sort of categories of taxes. Let's say I've got some products that need to be taxed higher than others because they include more imported materials. Some can be taxed lower because they're all, I don't know, locally sourced. So here, basically, I would create them and set where am I going to give them a name, where are they being sold to, what's the rate, I can create as many as I want. When we actually create the products, they can, then I can attach that, back, that tax band to a particular product. Um, this is more complicated than we need to get into, so I won't do anything under tax bands. I just did a tax rate, and then I'm going to save. We'll look at one more thing, then we'll take a break. We'll look at shipping. Shipping tab. This is another one that's pretty complicated. Could be pretty complicated. First, use shipping, yes or no. If you are selling digital downloads, you should turn this off. because You're not going to ship data in the mail. It downloads. Shipping origin city, the name of the city where you fulfill and ship your orders. And this enables for more accurate shipping costs. I'm just going to put San Diego, the origin, uh, let's put San Diego 91921. There's something called Shipwire, which I haven't used. I don't know too much about it. This is an e commerce fulfillment warehouse. I believe what they do is they offer warehouses for you to have your products in there and then ship them a little more cost-effectively throughout the US. This is uh, for the big players that have a lot of inventory that they need to move across the country. So we don't need that. Free shipping. Is there the ability to do some sort of free shipping discount? Maybe if your product is over a hundred dollars, free shipping because you know that amount of price takes care of all of that shipping. So do whatever you want here. Let's say $101.10. As long as you're selling over $101.10, free shipping. Yes? Um, would you also turn this on if you're, uh, you have to charge tax, but you have free shipping? Yes, you can charge tax, but free shipping, I would turn it off. If you are charging tax, but you're not doing any shipping, you I would turn shipping, that on. Mm, say that again. In other words, you sell a product and you put ten dollars plus tax, mm -hmm. but shipping included in my charge. Okay, um, shipping would be included uh, in your charge. You you sort of then don't need any of this. If it's included in it, you don't need to set up any of these extra rules for it. No. Nah. From this top section, I'm going to save those changes. Then we've got shipping modules, and then external shipping calculators. So the way this works, 
uh, we've got these settings of a flat rate, table rate, weight rate. Um, if you first open, for example, the settings of flat rate you have here, okay, what's it going to cost to ship a product throughout the U.S., the 48 contiguous states, or all 50 states, how much is it going to cost? Um, because this can, again, can get tricky. So let's say throughout the whole U.S., it's always just going to be a flat $3. But then if I go over to Hawaii or Alaska, $5. If I am going to ship internationally, then I can add a price here to add to all my products. This is the flat rate. If I wanted to use that, I would set some values, activate that check mark, and then save changes in that section. Now when a person is in my, in my um, store and wants to buy a product, they will have an option when they're going to check out flat rate. and It'll tell them $3. $3 might be very inadequate for a, a more heavier product because sh uh, shipping in the mail and, and FedEx and UPS and everything, it's all based on weight and the size and, and how cumbersome it is. So three dollars might be, might be you might be losing money. Maybe the box to just put the item in costs seven dollars. So flat rate might not be the best. I'm going to turn it off for the moment so that I can look at the settings. Table rate. You can turn all of these on, and give people the ability to select any of these. Of course. But I'm just going to look at one at a time. Table rate settings total price X and above costs this. So if you're selling anything that's at least, let's say, $5, the total price of the product, of all your products, together. If that's at least $5, then that's going to cost me $3 to ship it. I can add another one. If I'm going to be selling something that's $15 and higher, and that's going to actually need a bigger box, so it's going to cost me, or cost them, $5 shipping. And I can add as many of these as I want. Maybe now it jumps up to $30, and then that's going to be a $7 shipping price. So if I activate table rate, that'll kick in automatically depending on the prices of the products will then automatically charge them in a sense a flat rate but based on a table of the cost of the product. I'm going to turn that one off so I can look at the third one. Weight. This is similar to cost but now it's based on weight. So something that's 0 0.5 pounds and above will cost me $2. Something that's 1 pound and above costs more, and on and on. <clears throat> we can see this can get pretty complex. You can speak with your package, your package shipping company, to see what the best would be for you. That would be the U.S. Post Office, FedEx, UPS, DHL. What else is? What's that one with the little dog holding the box? On track, on track, etc. There's lots of companies out there now that will ship some, some you, some regional, some uh, national. But if you get with them and you're a small business and meet with their small business representative, they can give you better rates. You can go on the website and all of that. So for the moment, I think I'll just go with flat rate just to see what it looks like. Put in a couple dollars there, update it. Uh, for some reason, mine turned off. Enable shipping settings turned off. Make sure yours is on. And last in this screen, external shipping calculators. If you connect 
with USPS, so the post office, UPS, which is private, or Australia Post, they um, will integrate with your site a little better. For example, if I look at USPS settings, um, I can get a USPS ID and I can go on the website and register for it and what this will do is then it will keep track of every time you ship via USPS and the more you do it you get discounts and here's where a person can then select on their own uh, well I want to send this priority mail which is of course more expensive so if you want any of that extra stuff because we just uh, have flat rate uh, and then you decide how you spend that money on flat rate. But if you use one of these guys down here, USPS, UPS, Australia Post, you can have all these extra options of someone getting it faster for more price. I won't select any of those at the moment. That's more complex. You would need to create an account at UPS. Um, and the post office and UPS and all of them are pretty cool nowadays because you can schedule right on the website um, pickups you know if you're a home business and you're selling your items from your garage you can set us you can schedule a pickup for when your letter carrier drops off your mail or throughout the day and they'll pick it up right from your doorstep you can print the postage from your home computer and then just paste it onto the package and then you never have to leave the the house and you can even go to the post office in such an order free boxes postoffice.com, whatever it is, USPS, and get boxes. You can get free boxes to put your stuff in. And basically the post office nowadays, because so much competition, they have these free boxes and it says, if it fits, it ships. If your products fit inside this particular box, you can ship it. Not everyone might need to ship stuff. This is a big this is a big um, endeavor, perhaps, but the, the companies themselves are there to help you because they want your money. So I won't activate anything there, but I did have a flat rate and I've saved everything here. And that's uh, that's everything in our settings. Again, there's a lot of technical things, details here and there. We usually just set these things once and then we're ready to ship products and such. Um, you should revisit this once in a while to make changes as necessary. But for the moment, let's take our first break. When we come back, we'll actually start to add products. It's about 1.50. Let's take a break until, one, uh, until 2 o'clock, and then we'll proceed.